am i audible thank you so much for the kind introduction sir and uh, thank you everyone who has come here to listen i hope my experiences in the media and my own perspective is uh, relevant and uh, useful uh, to anybody to everyone who is listening okay uh, i think before i start my talk uh, maybe i can introduce myself a little my name is swati goel sharma i am from uh, i am from delhi from a city near delhi i have about 10 years of experience as a journalist i started with uh, uh, you know with national english dailies like hindustan times and times of india and uh, currently i work for swarajya uh, i am uh, as in i some time ago i also started like a welfare organization to help the victims on whom i write about and uh, i don't know how many people here are on social media but if you have heard of this handle called gems of bollywood that's also run co run by me where we call out the propaganda in bollywood to tell the story of how media changed i'll share my own um, own view on you know how i saw the media change and my own perspectives how it changed i uh, in 2014 i was in mumbai i just started out as a reporter in that city a city completely new to me so there was a case there that was published in a national english daily in a leading english da english daily on the front page it said that a woman was denied housing was denied a place on rent because of her religion the report had nothing except the girl saying that that the broker he denied her the place because because he did not like her religion her name was misba kadri so the next day the report was all over the place it was it had become a global news it was all over tv everywhere to me a very shocking thing was that the report flouted every norm of journalism i knew about you know you did not like we are we are we are not supposed to write a story based only on statement given by a person without any police complaint or without the perspective of a of another person you know of of whoever she is alleging against so i went uh, because i was in mumbai i visited the residential society in which it was claimed that she was denied a housing and to my utter surprise i found that there were in fact a lot of families of her religion living in that society and in fact she had been denied denied housing because she was not ready to pay pay the brokerage so basically the broker had given a complaint to police against her a month ago that she was illegally like you know staying in the place without due paperwork so that was the story basically this whole claim of being denied housing because of my religion was all a lie so i published that report it published in hindustan times but you know the global narrative didn't change because the report that had published saying that india and because it happened in 2014 the entire narrative was that ever since people elected a government which was supposed to be you know a pro hindu government like the bjp then such things are have begun to happen that people are denied housing because of their religion and the majority is acting up you know as is acting this way so this is how i i it was my first experiences as a person who saw that you know just to push a narrative people will flout every rule and they will basically you know uh, uh, as an they will bend all the journalistic rules just to push a narrative then when i dug a dip, like you know went a bit in the past i saw that it had been in fact the norm you know take up the ram janmabhoomi movement in the 1990s if you look at the media coverage then it was all against all like anti majority you know as if in fact there was no not even a pretense of being neutral the entire coverage was that there is a there is a mosque and uh, uh, some radical people some fanatics are claiming that there is a temple inside just to incite a minority community that's all it's it's really shocking how after so many years when supreme court actually gave a verdict that there was in fact a temple inside and uh, the claims of the babri committee were all false and all the left historians who were aligned with it were actually saying uh, were, were were saying lies then uh, you know all that narrative which they had been building in the 90s it really comes crumbling down but if you look at the if, if if you look at the coverage then it was really damning on the majority community it was almost like 
And you know, even at that time, they were painting India as a, as a land of fanatics who were oppressing all minorities. So this, is, uh, this was my introduction to how, uh, to how uh, media was not the voice of the masses. It was not the voice of the people. In fact, it was as away from the voice of people as it could be, because what people were asking for, the media was not ready to give them a platform. And what people, uh, in fact, you know, their, their, their truth was also being presented at lies. In fact, they were endorsing the, the interest of a particular interest group. In this case, the Babri Masjid Committee. You know, they, they were actually ask, uh, acting as partisan towards that group. So, so years have passed since then, and my uh, view of the media has only solidified that the legacy media, which before social media, was not the voice of people. It was the voice of a very specific interest group, and in all and in most cases, it has it has become a tool in the hands of you know for as a propaganda tool of an interest group. Then came social media, of course, and we know the story how we democratized media. How we did was that people started telling their own stories. A very remarkable example of it, of it is Kashmir. Uh, have you guys seen Kashmir Files film by any chance? So, see, much before the film was made, a lot of books were also written. And, the, and quite remarkably, a lot of Kashmiri Hindus had begun telling their own stories through social media. They had begun saying that whatever the mainstream and the legacy media was telling about Kashmir was all wrong, that they were, in fact, not, an, uh, not a migration, but an exodus. And it was not just, uh, you know, all communities were equally targeted by terrorists, no. One community which belonged to the other religion was obviously disproportionately targetary, targeted by terrorists who were also acting in the name of religion. So this is how, I mean, social media, yes, it democratized media, uh, as in the space to that extent, that media almost became irrelevant uh, as, as, a, as a platform which spoke for people, which spoke about people, which spoke, which claimed to speak for the for, for the people, it really became irrelevant. So, but the story doesn't end here because uh, you know the, all the old players also took to social media because they couldn't leave that space. You know the monopoly or let's say the influence they had over over policy making and over the global narrative. Do you know that there was a there were headlines published this week in many many publications which basically say is India moving towards a genocide of Muslims? Do you know that Time magazine has published an article saying that a, that a genocide of minorities is imminent in India, that India has reached grade 8 of a 10-level scale? I mean, if there is a 10-level scale on which a genocide is committed against a community, then India has reached level 8 of that community. Doesn't it shock you? Do you see it around? Do you, do you think that's really happening? Do you look around and think that, yes, I mean, do you, do you, think, do you look around and find people actually acting, acting so radical that they're all preparing for a genocide of a community? So these kind of lies we have raised here, how? I, I like to uh, share, you know, the, the how we have actually reached here. Uh, you know, in 2020, Delhi riots broke out. So in 2020, there uh, before 2000, as in uh, in 2019, a lot of people protested against the Citizenship Amendment Bill, which was a humanitarian bill that sought to provide protection to minorities in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. It was a long-held promise of the Indian government, and uh, uh, because we know they anyway keep migrating to this land, you know, uh, to escape persecution. So for many, many months, roads were blocked in Delhi. Incidentally, I also live there. And uh, many of my relatives directly faced the brunt of all that uh, blocking of the roads. Roads were blocked. Slogans like Khilafat 2.0 were written on the streets. People in Kerala especially have, you know, they know they have faced the brunt of the Khilafat movement. I mean, not our generation, not your generation, but people have. And uh, uh, the whole Mopla rebellion, it was, a, it was a part of it. It was a very dark chapter in the history of this state as well. Such slogans were written on the walls. 
and uh, uh, threatening slogans too. Uh, at one point of time, they also wanted independence not from India but also from the majority of the community and they said, so, said that much. So all this was playing out in the national capital city and the entire media, you know, all the media that has global contacts, they were just acting as PR, PR persons of, of that movement. They were projecting every celebrity, every film celebrity who visited those events as, as a revolutionary. They presented every student from a university who gave speech there as a great student leader. They presented those people who blocked the street without, in fact, even knowing you know, what, they, what they were really protesting against as some sort of really woke citizens, you know, very like alive citizens in a country of dead people. Something like that, you know, that's how it was all presented. And when those, all those, you know, because obviously uh, uh, that led to animosity, that led to animosities in the area, and especially between the two groups, you know, the largest minority and the majority community. Or also because the media was constantly doing things that was teasing, you know, uh, the people who were not protesting in in, against CAA, people who were protesting in favor of CAA, they were really um, vilified. So all that led to three-day rioting in Delhi. More than 60, like 200 people were injured, more than 50 people were killed. This is the official figure. Uh, you know, I happened to be on the site, on that riot side on the very day a policeman was killed and an intelligence officer was lynched by a mob. So it so happened that a relative of mine lives in that area and he got a WhatsApp video from one of his uh, groups, you know, a local group. It showed a man being lynched. The man was named Vinod Kashyap and uh, in the video one could hear that he was a resident of this particular colony and he had been killed because his his bike had a sticker called Jai Shri Ram. And there was a mob also visible in that video. I tracked down the street with the help of my relative and the very next day, like I got the video at 11 p.m. because it had happened an hour earlier. Okay, the incident happened at 10 p.m. and I got the video at 11 p.m. and I, in the morning, I reached the venue which was quite one and a half hours away from my home at 8 a.m. What I saw, uh, I had never seen some, something like that in life. There was not a soul on the streets. There was just CRPF, police, you know, the security personnel patrolling the streets. Um, and everybody was locked inside their houses. The, st the, the streets were so empty, it was impossible because, you know, that district also happens to be, to, happens to be the most populous district in the entire country. So that place was like desolate. And on top of it, two or three buildings were burning. They were all turning to ash as I was walking across. Suddenly a CRPF person was like, ma'am, what are you doing here? I said, I came with a driver, but the driver has run away with the car. <laughs> I mean, I, I came with a cab. And he was like, what are you doing? I mean, you cannot roam around. Either you accompany us and we'll drop you to the main road, or uh, this is not safe at all. I anyway stayed on and I spent two, three hours till at least some people come out on the streets. Then I went to the family, I talked to them. And you know, that very time when I was talking to the family in which a person had been lynched the, the, the previous night, two people were injured, two people were killed like two kilometers away from where I was. One of them was policeman Ratan Lal, who was lynched by a mob that was uh, anti-CAA. And another was an intelligence bureau officer. You know, there is this corporator called Tahir Hussain in the same area. So the entire building is owned by him. A lot of people work there. And that IB officer was returning from his house and he was dragged to a lane and he was beaten and he was lynched to death. That's how it happened. But you know, if you look at the Wikipedia right now, you will see that, the, they, that they have explained Delhi riots as Delhi riots was a pogrom against Muslims it was based, uh, the, in the exact sentences that it was a three-day rioting event in which Hindu mobs targeted Muslims. So it's, no, thank you.
I'm not used to this hot climate. Actually, it's as hot as in Delhi, just that it's a little more humid. I know I'm sweating like anything. Anyway, back to the story. Um, and you know, I like you know, I saw deaths like happening. Uh, I, I was in a spot where deaths of and like the majority community was happening between a one or two kilometers to my to where I was. But still, till date, the global narrative is that a lot of Hindu mobs killed people from the minority community. So it's so sad. It's really enraging. But but how did it happen? Because you know. These, these social media influencers, they are totally in cahoots with some global, uh, uh, some global voices that are bent on maligning India as a place where a genocide is impending. So uh, it's so bad that, uh, you know, every day there is a new report saying democracy has slid so many places. Uh, I mean, uh, democracy is being eroded in India and, uh, of course, the genocide uh, theory they keep pushing about and uh, freedom of press is so low that journalists are being killed and suppressed and stuff. So, uh, like the global image of India, they have made it so bad that, you know, as if everybody is uh, here um, involved in in, in targeting a particular community, whereas the true story is that there is a conflict and every community, I mean, both the communities are actually sufferers. You know, I was today coming in the flight from uh, Delhi to Kerala and I found a person who is from this state, but he works as in Yemen. And I just happened to ask him, do you follow news in India? He said, not really, but I know the situation is very bad. I know that, you know, there is a lot of religious conflict and these Hindutva people are going about in streets, you know, killing people. I said, are you crazy? When was the last time you visited India? He said, five years ago. He said, in five years, this is my first visit to India and I've been traveling uh, two days. Uh, and uh, this is just, I know. I said, what is your source of this information? Do you follow any particular channel or any particular newspaper? He said, no, I get all these things on social media. So this is how he's consuming his news and this is how a global narrative is being painted. Like as we talk here, as we sit here, as we go about doing our jobs, really like, the, like a lot of big section of the global media is full of these, uh, you know, these, these dark tales about this country and really vilify narratives about, about the majority of this community, which is essentially peaceful. All our uh, religious festivals are being painted as excuses to target a minority community. All, uh, all sort of, even these kind of events are being painted as just excuses to, to, to you know, plan a sort of genocide of other communities. So this is how, the, how bad the situation is. And uh, as I said, how did, this, how did we reach here? It's because, first of all, the media, the legacy media was very, it was, it was very dishonest. It was never the voice of the community. Secondly, when social media emerged and it was, the media was democratized, then even that was hijacked by these players with global powers because, you know, they are big. And have you seen something? I don't know how many people are on social media, but let's say if a, if a, if a case comes up or if, uh, if somebody, uh, uh, if, you know, like a very stray episode in any part of the country, let's say some cow smuggler uh, was going in the night and some villagers beat him up, these kind of inc incidents are like, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll find it suddenly, every, the next day they will appear in a very coordinated manner in the global media. Whereas the deaths of so many people will never appear. Imagine a place like Shraddha. Uh, I don't know how many people have heard, but have you heard of Shraddha Volkar, a, a girl from Maharashtra who was killed by her living boyfriend, Aftab? You know, this case never made it to global media, despite so much outrage in India about it, because it was part of a pattern. But a very small case, you know, of let's say a, a smuggler being beaten, that makes it to global me media in no time. And that, and, and not just it makes it to the global media, but it also becomes another entry, another, another uh, let's say, addition to this, you know, to this whole narrative that there is a genocide going on. So I feel that's a very uh, scary picture uh, because, uh, because, because these things have implications. Because this is actually a form of anarchy. So what is happening right now in India is because some old legacy media has uh, lost its space and lost its, posi lost its position as, uh, in, uh, you know, as a, as a, 
as somebody who had monopoly on information, they have now become, you know, it, it seems like they are pushing anarchy. And you see it everywhere. Anywhere there is an event, uh, you know, like, a, like if there is, they have to protest against CA, then it will be turned into an event, where it's basically an, a whole coordinated event to bring on the government. If there is a, a farmer protest going on, you will see a picture of Vendra Wale being put up, who was a, an out-and-out -out Khalistani um, a propagandist. You know, uh, and when whistleblowers on social media, they, they point it out, then those people are vilified as with very bad labels, like, you know, Godi media, or words, fascist. This is a new term. No, not actually a new term. This is, has been in place quite, quite a uh, while for Hindu nationalists. But uh, this is how every voice that is speaking against anarchy is being subdued, is being vilified and is being silenced. So uh, what we have to really uh, check out against is this growing design for anarchy in this country. Now I'll also uh, like to say, like, you know, I have spoken about the problems in media and in social media and how uh, everything is towards, um, you know, moving towards the dream state of anarchists and, you know, they want to pull down this government anyhow. But it's not just about pulling down this government, it's also about pulling down the people who elected this government. See, it was only, if it was only about a particular prime minister of a particular uh, you know, a particular political party, it wouldn't be so bad. But then right now what's happening is anybody who elected that government is also being, uh, is also being maligned, and which basically means the entire country is being maligned. What I have seen in media is like right now it's a site of gang war. You know, even on social media, uh, so uh, the entire effort is not to push any national interest now, any, anything of national interest, but no. It's like, you know, pulling each other down or uh, labeling people. And basically, the, it, it seems like it's a site of gang war. So if, I mean, I wouldn't blame anybody if they do not trust news or media these days. One second. I'm sorry, I think something got in my eye. One second. Yeah, uh, sorry. So, uh, yeah, to continue uh, the point was I was saying that the thing is the media as an industry has to go back to its root. Media, the definition, the very definition of media is a recording of daily events and uh, collecting of information and presenting to the public, saying it as it, as it was without, uh, uh, you know, without and also being very neutral about it. You cannot just you know, keep on giving one kind of information, one kind of cases only. So what I think is that, first of all, media has to go to a space where, uh, <laughs> yeah. where it goes back to its roots. That's how people will start trusting media and that's how media will also play a role, a constructive role, instead of being a, being a nuisance and being, and being an enabler of animosity between communities. And secondly, uh, you know, people, uh, like it has, to, it has to stop being a site of gang war. People have to talk, talk, talk to each other and uh, uh, like the whole space has to be less partisan and uh, uh, basically, there should be a common goal of nation building and a common goal of of harmony. You know, that's how that's how that's how we can say that media is really like a fourth pillar of democracy. Because right now, it seems more like a tool of anarchy than than playing any constructive role. Thank you. Powered by Demos Furniture, Logo Furniture Golde Vamban Unlock.